and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club. I'm your host this evening. Uh, I'm Tobias. Will is not with us. Uh, we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. As attendees of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club, you are now all members, provided you adhere to our philosophy. Ex curiositas scientia. We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual noviceship. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything, and thus we remain perpetually curious and perpetually novice. This is our flag and our mascot, Franklin. The lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the resonance of truths understood. It awakens and excites us and makes us hungry for more. Curiosity Club is made merrier by our fellow artisans at Fort George Brewery in Astoria, Oregon. And now, uh, let's give a warm Curiosity Club welcome for our returning alumnus, Carl Anderson of Futel and Chuck 666. Hello. Um, I'm Carl, I'm from Futel. This is the information about us, if you want to learn more already. But um, I'm not used to having an intro like that, so I like to start out with some vacation pictures so people can trickle in. Uh, this is uh, Paris. I really like the Paris uh, phones because they're sort of modular and modern, but I can still think of someone like some beat noir dude, you know, slouching into the phone, smoking. They still have these glass booths, though. Budapest was my favorite because they didn't really care, <laughs> and I like their, uh, I like their uh, pictographs here, that smiling guy right there. Uh, that one's cool, but this was my favorite because it's just like two pieces of glass and a roof and one's longer. Like, did the wind come from there? Did the crowds come from there? Why is that one longer? I don't know. Um, am I good with this mic? All right. Yeah, all right. Um, this is Prague. I, I just like the way the phones looked. Um, but uh, we also went to Amsterdam and there were no phone booths in Amsterdam. And I never understood that because we were in kind of the touristy, like Disneyland section of Amsterdam, but, but Prague, same thing. I never really left the touristy part of Prague, and Prague was full of phone booths. So I don't know why, I don't know why Amsterdam, they didn't want to, they took out their phone booths. And usually, when I'm, whenever I'm somewhere, I like to think, where's the nearest phone booth? And right now, it's probably the Greyhound station, although it might be the Max Stop. Does anyone know where the nearest phone is? Payphone? Max Stop. Max Stop, yeah, yeah. On, uh, yeah, so because it was cool, they, they put in phones in there, <coughs> but of course there's a lot fewer phones now than there were before. I mean, there's still a few pay phones here and there, uh, but we are trying to uh, change that by forming Futel, which is sorry, bad slide, um, which is uh, Portland's newest and most affordable phone company. But before I tell you what Futel is, I should probably tell you about the background, kind of what. Our, our spiritual ancestors are because they're not our, they're no one that's associated with us, but they're the people who have kind of inspired us to do what we do. And the big part of that is a group called the Phone Freaks, which were a hacker, sub, a hacker subculture from, well, the 60s and the 70s, 60s through the 90s, really. But um, 60s and the 70s were when they were most active and when they would meet up and, and they, this was a zine of the Youth International Party Line, which was a subgroup of the Yippies, although maybe not an official subgroup, maybe they were just um, a kind of an organic um, group to spring up. But what the Freakers were interested in was manipulating and exploring the phone network. And they did that for, they did a bunch of things. They would get free calls, they would steal service, but they would also just try and manipulate this network here. Because back then, this was the only computer that you interfaced with, if you were a normal person. If you weren't an academic or a professional in a lab or something like that, the phone was an early computer switching system. Like back in, way back in the day, when you called someone, you would say, operator, give me Pennsylvania 65000, and the operator would plug you in and and route you closer to Pennsylvania, or not Pen wherever that is, and, uh, and connect with another human being. And it was all about humans sticking little plugs in little holes. But then they invented switching systems and analog computers and then digital computers to, to route those calls for you. But the only way that a lot of these computers could be controlled was through sound. 
So your phone was your interface to the computer, and they didn't <coughs> realize that people would, well, maybe they realized, maybe they just didn't care. They didn't think they'd have to care, but they didn't kind of predict that people would be exploring that and manipulating that. So people would do fun things like they would call across the street, but they would route the call around the world. So it would go from, <laughs> they would cause it to go here and there, or they could find out that when they would go through a certain interlink, you could hear the ka-chunk, ka-chunk, and they would make weird noises happen and stuff like that. All from, from putting tones in the phone. So here's, here's a, I think this is a blue box. This is a, this, so again, this is another Yipple zine. This is from October 1971. And uh, this is probably just distributed through mimeographs, or maybe they had Xeroxes then, I'm not sure. But um, very kind of uh, low key. And uh, so a blue box was a way to, to put, your, put your tones in the phone and change where the routing would go, get long distance calls or move it. I forget exactly what a blue box did. Another thing was a red box. If you played a certain tone, or rather, if you put a quarter in a payphone, you would hear this noise, G -g 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 -g. and that noise was the the phone telling itself or the the upstream provider, the phone company, depending on how the phone worked. That was the phone telling the provider that there was a quarter going into that coin box. So if you were to play those tones into the receiver of the phone, G -g 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 -g, then the phone would give you a quarter credit. So there was all sorts of kind of measures and countermeasures against that. The phone companies would turn off the microphone until you were connected, and uh, then someone realized that if you called someone and then just let them hang up, then the microphone was still active, and then you could make another call. Um, and all, you know, all sorts of ways around that. So the, uh, um, and so the, the uh, well, the reasons for that, the reasons for doing that were to steal service. That was a big part of it. But another big reason for that was just to fight the man, you know, because the phone company was the phone company. The phone company was, was Big Brother. It was Ma Bell. It was a monopoly. <laughs> and it was part of the war machine. Like, every quarter that you didn't give to the phone company was thought, in this kind of torturous logic sometime, but it was thought as, <laughs> as you were denying the Vietnam War or something like that. So it was, it was stealing, it was stealing for a good cause, and it was stealing just to steal. And the, but it was just exploration, it was just manipulation too. It was just like, what can I do? I'm, I'm this, this nerd somewhere. How can I make this giant computer do what I want to do? And so eventually, phone freakers kind of, they're not as out there anymore. I mean, they're out there. People are still doing fun stuff, but uh, it's kind of got subsumed by larger hacker culture. This is a kind of a more general hacker magazine called 2600, which is based on the 2600 tone that a guy named John Draper found out that uh, if he blew a toy whistle that he got in a Captain Crunch box, <coughs> if he blew that into the phone, that would, that, would, that would sound the 2600 hertz tone, maybe with another tone I forget, but that, that he could control certain aspects of the phone by blowing this toy whistle into the, into the phone. So, so all sorts of reasons to do that. Um, just you know, the phone company was thought of just uh, as something that you know you should, if you can, you should. And I like this logo here; it has the Liberty Bell with the bell system thing. Um, and so there's there's nowadays it's it's uh, you don't need to look for a reason to want to fuck with the phone company. This is a <laughs> this is a, this slide is washed out, but this is an NSA logo with a lot of stuff, and a group called the EFF, Electronic Fr Frontier Foundation, made this logo. They put AT and T in here to kind of show the collusion, to demonstrate this collusion that AT and T had with the NSA. The, the AT and T did some illegal spying on Americans at the behest of the NSA. Um, they actually said to the NSA, we'll give you a little room in our San Francisco switching office here that you can put your equipment in here and slurp all, all the communications you want. And nowadays, they, they've had to like, make several versions of this, put Verizon in there, put something else in there, because that's, what, that's how you make money off of people. You, know? you, you collect data on them, and then you use that. So, and another reason there was all this kind of hacking and freaking and all that is because the kind of idea was, if you can do it, you should do it. If, if they're going to make this giant computer that we all live inside of, basically, if you can manipulate that by playing some, co some tones into your phone, then you should. If you, can, if you can steal that, you should. If you can kind of throw a little wrench in the machine, then you should. That was kind of an idea there. 
And there's a lot of other groups like that. Groups or philosophies like that too. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of people who will find a way to exploit a system and they'll just do it because it's easy. This is um, this is kind of just a philosophical tie-in with an organization, um, which again I'm I'm only inspired by them. I'm not I'm not associated with them, but it's called Planka. Planka Planka. Um, it's the Fair Jumpers Union, in uh, Fair <laughs> Baders Union in uh, Northern Europe somewhere. I think uh, Scandinavia. Um, and their rules are you pay your, your union dues to join them, and you promise to never pay your subway fare um, <laughs> if you, if, unless you have a really good reason. And they will provide with you, to you legal aid if you get caught. Wow. And so <laughs> the idea is like we're going like, to socialize your system here. Like You might not want to, but we're going to socialize it for you. Um, when, I was in, when I was in Chicago, the L was a dollar. And this one group was agitating for it to be free because they said that 90 cents of that dollar were spent just handling the money, just doing something with that dollar. So the idea was that we shouldn't charge people for it because we don't have to, really. Because it's, like, it's, something, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a forced socialization. So nowadays, you know, I mean, so that's, that's, a, that's a criminal aspect of the hacker and future <laughs> community. Whether it's, whether it's altruistic criminal or selfish criminal, is, it depends on who you ask and who's doing it. Um, but it's not the only reason to do stuff like that. And nowadays, the, the phone stuff is not so much, is a lot of the phone stuff you see is groups like CNET, which this is a very boring slide, but I just want to talk about this group, uh, the Collectors Network. And they do things like they'll put uh, obsolete switching equipment on the phone network. Like you can call in and like, and you can use your blue box on it, or or like <laughs> figure out how to manipulate it or something like that. Or just you know, li the one one guy has this all the switching stuff in his house, and you can call it in, and you can he you can just hear the noises of the switching system as it calling, just just for nostalgic reasons. Because there's a lot of like crusty old guys who just you know, they they, they don't want to let go of the past because I mean that was their heyday. They like it, you know, and I, I don't blame them. <clears throat> so that's some of our uh, that's some of our um, history of not our history, but the history that inspires us to do what we're doing. So now I can tell you what Futel is. We are a phone company. We are Portland's most affordable and smallest phone company. <laughs> we are two developers and a lot of contributors <laughs> who are doing stuff that we're not so good at, or just people who want to help with, with uh, design or physical work or something like that. And uh, we are sticking phones in public places and then not charging for them. So here is, oh, there's a better slide. You can see that, I like that. You can see the, our name up there. Um, so this is a pay phone that you can walk up to and use. Um, and the main reason to use it is because it's a, it's a phone. It's a free phone. You, you get a dial tone and you can make a domestic call. We don't have international calls because that's more expensive for us, but um, the main thing is just that dial tone there. And uh, that's, I mean, that's the, uh, that's always the core of what we do is a free dial tone is, a, is just offering that communication to people. But there's also other things you can do with it too, uh, interactive things. We have a little menu. You can call a bunch of CAN numbers like social services and stuff like that. We get free <coughs> voicemail. Um, which is not very usable now. We'd like to expand that in the future. We'd like to be able to, to, for instance, give out an incoming number with an extension or just a number so that people can call your voicemail and they don't know that you didn't just pick up the phone. You know, They don't know that you don't actually have a phone. For all they know, it's just a number that they didn't pick up. Um, we have a free one-touch dialing to the mayor, if you want to talk to the mayor. Um, we have a bunch of... Uh, other interactive things, uh, uh, you can call the collector's network and interact with their phones and stuff like that. Um, we've, done, we've done other things in, in less public locations. Uh, this was at a uh, festival we did. We had a radiation monitor in the phone. So if you call, it was a Geiger counter, if you, uh, if you called a certain number, you would hold your sample up to the, to the, to the, the uh, detector or if you just wanted to hear the ambient radiation, you would call it and it would tell you what it was, a voice would tell you. We've had, uh, 
uh, we've had a Nintendo game in the phone. You can play Tetris. That's not. That doesn't really. I mean, you need a screen for that. You know, it doesn't. I like. I like how things that it's just the the interface is the phone. You know, you got your headset. Um. And so we'd like to do more. Um, more kind of artists. We'd like to have some attract artists and residents. And you know, read. And we'd like to be able to have like more community stuff. You know, there were all sorts of interesting stuff like that. I've always wanted to play Zork in the phone. If I could figure out a way to do that, um, I like this. This is a. This is some uh, of the the copy on the phone that we're working on to replace the the, the stuff like that. This uh, man. I hate the one. I hate the. I hate the the phone. And a, and, a, and a pay phone, you see this, and it says, the first thing it says is stop. Like, stop, you need to use this phone properly. You know, like, we don't, you can use the phone however you want. It's great for prank calls, you know. You, like, we don't judge why people use it or who they call. If you want to call your meth dealer, like, that's not, I don't like that, but to stop that would be filtering out, like, how could I filter that out without, without listening in and, like, telling you how you need to communicate with someone? Because that's what, well, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> but uh, I should probably talk. Oh, so, so that's what we're doing. You know, I talked about the freaks. You know, I talked about the hackers and stuff. We are a lot more boring than that. We are buying service and giving it away. We're not. <laughs> we're not. You know, we're not being clever like that. To I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that, but we're not stealing anything. But it's a time. I mean, we we just. <laughs> We just like phones, you know. We like that that public hardware, and it's a time when a a small group of geeks, you know, a a, a, a small community of a handful of people, which is what we are, it's, you know, two core people, and then a handful of people helping, can can. I mean, it's it's a time of great individual geek power because two people can do can we can start a phone company when you know back when I was a kid. You would need millions of dollars of equipment. You would you would need to pay rent on the rooms of equipment just to do that. But we're able to do that with a, with a few computers. And uh, I should probably tell you a little bit about how we do that. Who who's interested in hearing about the the software and stuff like that? All right. Some people did not raise their hand, so I will keep it very short because it's very hard to say this in a non-boring way. But what we're doing is we are um, we are uh, we have a phone. And that talks to what's called a little SIP box. Uh, it turns a phone into what's called a VoIP phone, voice over IP. Voice over IP is a protocol that is used, uh, like when you use Google Voice, that's voice over IP. When you use a Skype, that's probably voice over IP. When you, and when you use your phone, there's voice over IP. Some, some of your phone calls are just going through the internet, whether you know it or not. That's just how it works. That is talking to a cloud box. Uh, cloud box, by that I mean a virtual box, a, a computer that we rent, which uh, uh, it's not an actual physical computer. We're basically renting time on a simulated computer simulated by another computer. Um, and that costs us $5 a month, except that DigitalOcean, uh, our provider, is giving that to us for free because I begged them for it. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, so, oh, but wait, let me backtrack. The, uh, the SIP box talks to our router. Can't see that very well, but the router is a little Linksys router uh, from the 90s or 2000s, and we use that because we can flash, no, 2000s, not 90s. But we, we use that because, first of all, because they're cheap. We can buy them at Goodwill for five or 10 bucks, and we can flash our own software on them. Not our own software, but we can flash open source software on them, because if you don't, if you're using a router that you, that you if you're using the proprietary software that comes with a the router, there's a backdoor in it. There's a way for someone to get into that router. I can't tell you that for sure, but when, when you hear about a new exploit like that every month, it would be foolish not to believe that. Um, but also, most importantly, is that these routers um, can natively, in the router, speak a protocol called uh, OpenVPN, a VPN protocol, virtual private network, that gives us an encrypted connection to our VPN box on the cloud. And that VPN box is talking to our VoIP box, running a piece of software called Asterisk. And the reason we insist on using that VPN is because Asterisk is this amazing open source, I mean, it's a free phone, it's a free VoIP software, it's a free phone switching software, which is pretty amazing. It's just made by, by you know, geeks doing this for their job mainly. But it's, uh, but it's also very clunky and there's, a, a, bugs are found on it all the time. There's all sorts of like, 
there's all sorts of ways to break in there and all that. So we, we insist on having an encrypted connection to our VoIP box because we are not experts on that. Like, uh, we don't really, we would rather not have to keep up on every single bug that they find in that. We'd rather be able to update it, you know, when we can. And we update it fairly, recent, fairly rapidly, but we don't want to have to update it within 10 minutes when the new comes out. Because when you put an asterisk box on the open net, we, when we do that, we find that within 30 seconds, people are rattling our doorknobs. People are trying to connect, and they're trying to break in. They're trying to see if, they can, if we've just forgotten to protect something or if they can exploit some, something that's there that we might not know about. Um, so, I mean, that's funny, because those are today's freakers trying to break into us and steal service from us. But they, they're, they're doing things like they're trying to steal service and then resell that, or they're trying to make us call uh, like toll lines that they get a kickback from. Like we like we'll get charged a dollar and they'll get a penny or something like that. Will you raise your hand? Yeah. How many attempts would you say that you get uh, of those sort in like say a week or a month? Well none because we're behind the VPN box. So you would have to to, to do that you would have to break into um, our open VPN box. Our the, the VPN protocol, which is very robust. That um, I don't know of any way. I mean I'm sure I'm sure there have been exploits in the past. I mean there's there are exploits, uh, the, like the web, the net, it's, it is the wild west. There's, like, there have been exploits found in critical parts of, of the web, like everything that, like, that everyone relies on to, to keep their communications private. There, there's always bugs found, but, but OpenVPN is, is robust, it's really well used, and because it's well used, like, those, those exploits are found and patched quickly. So that, that's what protects us. Um, and so that's it, that's talking to our Aster box, which is talking to our upstream VoIP provider, which is where we buy the service from. And that is costing us um, two cents a minute. We need to switch providers to get to a cheaper one. Um, uh, but that's, uh, that, I mean, so that's who we talk to upstream, is, a, is someone we buy service from. So that's, that's what we're doing, is we are, we are providing a way to uh, to route the, to, to use that SIP service, that VoIP service from our phone. So um, that's what we do. And when I tell people what we do, a lot of times they ask me why. Uh, some, some people say that's cool, and some people say, I don't understand why you want to run a phone company. <laughs> Especially people who have done this for a living, who had to be phone administrators and use this software for a living in their day jobs, they 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 find it odd. <laughs> and um, our motivation, our motivation is because we like phones, and our motivation is to discover and illustrate the meaning behind the technology of everyday life. Uh, the 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 computers that we interact with, the computers that we, that we literally, when I say we live in a computer, I mean that we literally live in a computer. Our interactions are mediated by a computer. And that has been the case, I mean, that has been the case before people knew what a computer was, really. That, that has been the case when, whenever there was a, whenever there was communication that was mediated by, by a remote human agency, that, that's been the case. It's just, it's just true more so now. But this, we are, we're fascinated by, by urban kiosks. We're fascinated by public, uh, public ways to interact with that technology. It's gotta be public and it's gotta be urban. It's gotta be accessible by anyone. Anyone has to be able to walk up to it. It's not a Burning Man thing or a, like any type of like festival thing. Not, not there's anything wrong with that, but that's not what we, that's not what motivates us. And I think that's, one reason for that is because I grew up in the 80s. And this is a, uh, this is an illustration, it's either a cover illustration or an adaptation, like a comic book or something like that, for William Gibson's, one of William Gibson's Sprawl trilogy books. Uh, if you've heard of them, Neuromancer, Mona Lisa Overdrive, and Count Zero, I forget the order. But you see here, so this is, this is so he wrote these in the 80s. And, uh, he's, oh man, I love this scene here. You got, you got your console cowboy, that's probably Case right there. He's got his deck, he's, he's carrying his deck with him. Uh, you got Molly here. This does not look like Molly should li like should look like, but she's got her <laughs> mirror shades that are implanted into her eyes. You have a city which could be 
Taiwan or Chiba City or San Francisco. No idea where the city is. It's just got all, all language. All, you got this crumbling infrastructure. You got these weird pipes and stuff everywhere. You got some kind of urban shaman here with his, his herbal wares here, you know, bending over. And you have a payphone. You got a payphone and a phone kiosk. Because that was really important to, to the whole story and flavor back then. Because back then, two, you know, two things when I, when I look back on those books, two things Gibson did not predict. One was the fall of the Soviet Union. It was the United States and Russia. And the other was, was personal you know, pocket computers. You know, the little the pocket computer that everyone carries around in their pocket all the time, which is a phone and a lot of other things. But he didn't think that he didn't he didn't think that that would be something that you would carry. He, would, he didn't he didn't see the the infrastructure part of it. That the phone could the phone network could wirelessly beam that to your phone. So there was always a payphone there. There's a great scene where the protagonist case is walking by a bank of payphones. And they each ring one by one as he walks by them because someone's trying to contact him. So back then, like we thought this is our future, you know, this is what the future is gonna be, the, the gritty urban future, which is we didn't think that this vibrant, well-connected utopia would be. We, we thought this we were gonna get this utopia here. We didn't think we were gonna get our shit world of today, where if you walk outside right now, people are they're bowed down. Yeah. They can't, the phone is telling them what to do. It's telling them who they can talk to. It's telling them what you can say. Like when you type in your phone, the phone is completing your words for you. And if that word isn't in the dictionary, it's, it's harder to do it. I mean, you can get around it, but it's, it's like, I, that, I don't like, I don't like that he everyone's head is down. All they're looking down all the time. I mean, it's just, I mean, there's, there's part of it which is just stupid. Like, the people, I, whenever I see someone jaywalking and looking at their phone, I think, this is, this is what today, like, these are the stupid years of today. That's what makes it. But even, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, okay, it's okay. It's okay to. I mean, I I like I like phones. I, there's there's a good technology and it's good for a lot of things. But I don't I don't like that they've. When I like you know I, I'm a software engineer. That's my day job. And I was always I've always been enthused by the networks that will connect us. You know, this is how we'll be able to communicate with each other in new ways. And I still am. But it's just. It's so easy just to slough off from the, you know, the, the baser instincts of humanity and make money that way, you know. Because when, in the 90s, in the early 2000s, people with cell phones, they were important, you know. They had these big phones, you needed a lot of money to be on that network. And if you saw a guy sit down at dinner and put his, you know, you see guys, I mean, you see today too, but you see a guy sit down at dinner and he'd put his phone down on the table. And he was saying like, I need a, like I might need to take a phone call here, and like like I might have to stop talking to you and take the phone call. And today you see that too, but, but they're not fooling anyone. They're looking at Instagram on the phone. You know, you know what you're doing on the phone when you do that. So so we like, this is our chance to like to to keep some of that alive. You know, to to put this out here and. Uh, and let people interact with that. Here's another inspiration for me, which you can call on the few telephone today um, with the one touch dialing. It's the apology line. A man named, uh, I think his name was John Bridge. Um, he put up these signs in New York in the 90s, late 90s, mid 90s. Um, and he said, uh, you need to apologize for whatever you've done. You've wronged someone, everyone's wronged someone. So call this number. And you can apologize. It'll just be you and a machine. If you're if you're talking about something like a crime, then call from a payphone. Um, you don't need to you don't need to identify yourself. And so it was basically an audio zine. It was basically a voicemail box. It was well, it wasn't even a voicemail box. It was an answering machine. So you would call. You get a little introduction, and then it would beep, and um, you could make your confession to the phone. And then he would he would kind of collate the interesting ones, what he thought was interesting. And so you could listen to a digest of other apologies, and then you could comment on them, and he would kind of curate a, a kind of a, a comment discussion based on that. So people would talk back and forth. 
Um, I called him a lot because I had free phone calls back then, so I was able to do that. Um, he actually was killed. He was a snorkeler. He was scuba diving or snorkeling or something, and he was run over by a jet skier. Um, but it's still alive today. Um, uh, someone else has kind of taken up the mantle, and uh, so there's a new apology line, and uh, you were able to do that from the T-Tel phone. So I mean, the, just, just participatory technology is one reason. And the other reason is that obsolete technology, I like, I like, uh, I like keeping proficiency in obsolete technology, because that technology might not be obsolete in the future. We might find a, a use for that someday. So I kind of want to keep my hands in it. I want to keep it alive. And it's, it's, uh, it's something that I can, I, I can put it on the street and people will use it. There's a guy, like, one of the other reasons I, I put it out there is there's a guy who was mowing my lawn, and he couldn't always keep his phone paid up. He had, a, he had a phone, but he couldn't always like buy new minutes for it. So he would just push his lawnmower around the sidewalk and ring my doorbell every weekend, and other people's doorbells too, and ask me if I needed my lawn mowed. But if I wasn't, if I wasn't home or if I didn't need to mow that, then, then he, he, he pushed his lawnmower, you know, he's doing his route, but he, didn't, he, did, it, he did it for nothing, you know. But, but I thought if he had a phone, then we could, we could coordinate, we could, we could leave messages or work it out someday. And that's what, that's what the phone has done for a lot of people. Like I, I've, I've read about stories in uh, villages in Africa where there's a farmer and uh, he needs to sell his produce um, at a 10 mile, uh, 10 mile away village maybe. Maybe there's a village, he lives in one village, there's one, there's a place he could sell it here, one here, and there's 10 miles each way. And it takes him all day to get there, pushing him on his bike or whatever. So um, he can, if he doesn't have a phone, he just has to get his stuff over there and then like what if there's a glut of that thing? What if, what if the, the buyer says, well, we're gonna give you this crap price for it? Then he's, like he has to say, I'll take it because he's not gonna go back home. You know, he's, he's, spent, he's spent his day doing that travel. But, uh, but so nowadays people have, because uh, there was no phone service in a lot of rural places in the third world. But uh, now there's satellite phones and there's cell phones so what will happen is someone will buy cell phone service and they'll sell, they'll sell that phone service. They'll have a, a, a cell phone that, you know, it's in a little house or something like that, but you basically use the phone for a dollar or whatever. And then you can figure out what the price, you can call and see what the price is gonna be. And then the, the, it gives the individual some power to negotiate that way. But it's easier for us to do that with a, with a, with a pay phone. With the phone. You know, the phone, pay phone is a, it's an armored piece of equipment right there. Like this punk is obviously staged. Look how polite he is talking on the phone. <laughs> Hi, mom. But the you know, thing about a phone is that a lot of people, times when people are mad at the people at the other end, they'll take it out on the phone, you know, when they're yelling or something. So that's why the payphone is armored. You can't steal it. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, so, you know, I'm not knocking, what, I, I'm saying all this because I'll rag on, I rag on cell phones a lot, but they're, they're, they're good, you know. They're good technology. They're they're good for something, you know. Like here's a here's a here's here's an example of that. This is someone's payphone here. It's their it's their mobile phone, you know. And, uh, so so that's our reason. That's our reasons for doing that. That's that's what we do. That's how we do it, and that's why we do it. It's something that um, I I mean I've I've said about a lot of wacky things, you know, a lot of kind of like ideas and stuff like that. But the core reason is that. It's something that we can, we can get for cheap and give away. It's within our means to give it away. And it's, it rewards us because it's fun to do it. You know, it exercises our kind of hacker nature. So that's why we do it. So um, that's my talk. Um, I'd like to say that uh, if there's any we can always use contributions. We're always looking for locations to put a phone. If, if you can think of a protected location that can get internet and power um, and that's open to the public, we're interested in that. We're always interested in donations. If you'd like to buy a t-shirt, uh, have that. And if you'd like a free sticker, I'll put a sticker out here that you can stick on places. Um, and we're always looking for operators. Um, one, one thing we offer is you can dial zero and talk to a human being if you need a human being to talk to. So, uh, operator shifts are available, and uh, like I said, our artist in residence program we're working on. If you have some, if you have any ideas that you'd want to uh, 
to implement and something that can be used with a telephone interface. That's something we're always interested in, and uh, we can work out ways to, to, to kind of meld the artistic and the technical sides of that. So thank you. Yeah, back, far back. Uh, where do we find telephones? Where do we find telephones? Craigslist and eBay. Mm, nice. um, but uh, what was your other question? Where, how did you think the first spot, the first location? Well, the first location is in front of my house. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I did that is because, well, because I, I didn't have to ask anyone permission. But also, um, the permit, if, if I were to put it on the, it's, it's on the property, but accessible from the sidewalk. Should have gone the other way. There you go. It's accessible from the sidewalk. Those aren't my chickens. Those are the neighbor's chickens. They, they, they come and they raid my garden. Um, I don't like them. But, uh, so... If it were to be here on the right of way, it would cost us 450 bucks a year to get the permit evaluated. So that, was, that would be the first thing. So, so this lets me just put it here and you can still reach it from the side. You know, I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to just do that, put it here, and then when they complain, just, just take it and move it somewhere else, you know. But, but really, um, I mean, this concrete work was very, you know, that was, that was a lot of work to do that. So we just put it there, that's fine. <laughs> yeah? So how many are there and how often do they get used? There's two. Yes. We're always looking for more locations. Yes. Yeah, there's two. Um, they get used, I think, I forget if it was 200 or 400 minutes a week these days total. Uh, it's 200, one phone is being used 200 minutes a week. There's one guy that uses this phone almost every day for 15 to 90 minutes. Um, and he uses it between 2 and 5 a.m. and sometimes we'll come up and make a call. I've never seen him. I don't, like when people use the phone, I like to ignore them because some people um, are, some people don't, you know, some people, like they don't want you to see them using the phone for whatever reason. They're like, you know, um, you know, they might be having an emotional conversation. I'm like, I don't know who the guy calls. You know, I don't know. I don't know. It's a residential number somewhere, but other than that, I don't know. Yeah. Can you, so analytics, do you, like, do you know, like, how, how far, like, like, how far the calls are being made? At least they're domestic, but are, like, are they within the city or across the U.S.? Or? We'll see, because numbers nowadays, the area codes don't mean as much, but you can find out where the number has been like what carriers run that number now, um, but I don't. I so I, I can you know I see the numbers because I need to see the numbers in the logs, but they don't mean anything to me. You know, so. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your operators? How they got looked into it? What their motivation is? And maybe shed a little light on the mysterious chain, chain, Jamesy fans, Lancy pants. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lancy pants. That is Lancy pants. Um, Lancy Pants is a friend of mine. This phone, this picture was not staged. I stole this from uh, an Oregonian reporter who wanted to do a little photo pictorial on it. Um, but while she was taking the picture, Lancy Pants rode up on his bike, and I said, "Oh, this is Lancy Pants, who I was telling you about." And uh, he said, "Yes, I'm Lance. Um, I'm about to use the phone. If you'd like to take my picture, you may." So that's uh, him using the phone. Um, he's a friend of mine. He. Um, He's just, uh, he lives in a rural, he lives on this uh, anarchist commune that uh, the anarchists in, I forget when, but they were t too many alpha anarchists and they kind of imploded. And he's a sole survivor. So he's, uh, he, he has a different, you can, and you can, uh, you can dial him, he's one of the CAN numbers, you can reach him with one, with one number. Uh, and the reason for that is just because he has a different, uh, different take on a lot of things, and that might be valuable for people. Does, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> In the back. Huh? Is there a start menu? There is, depending on the phone. We have one phone. We give service to Right to Dream, and they just have a dial tone. 
I wanted to convince them to, to have a menu because I thought they would be interested in, in just like um, giving people some, you know, basically like um, something to do, you know, like, you know, don't tell it to me, tell it to the mayor or something like that. Are I, they? I, I think we'll add that. Too. All right. That All right. Yeah. Their service works great. We don't have the full pay phone set up, but their service works and helps a lot of people. So they have, they have this in Dalton, but on this phone, uh, you get a, you get a menu. Um, and so the first thing is to make a call for us one. That I you think we'll have John Calper on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, I gotta go to another meeting. Thank you very much. Yeah. So um, I like. I mean that that was a hard decision because I I like the dial tone. You know, my friend was my friend was helping me move something, and he had his his six year old kid, and he said, well, "Why don't you call your mom on, on that phone over there?" And he picks it up and he says, "It's broken." I'm like, what? Well, it's broken. He's like, "Yeah, she's making this noise." <laughs> <laughs> So I, I mean, I like having the dial. I was thinking maybe having the dial tone with a little quick, like press one for menu, but that's what it is right now. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm interested in how old you are, because that sort of dates you in terms of phone technology. Like, were you alive when nobody owned their phone? You know, and like you didn't you rented it from the phone company, or what, what was your phone experience as a youth? Yes, I, I'm very old. <laughs> when I was a kid, my parents ran a business from out of their house, so I and they they, they so they had phone lines in the house, and then they got rid of one. So I had my own phone line for a while, which that was like, yeah, like I could get called late at night and stuff like that. That was cool. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I hate to ask, but what do you think about your liability? Like, if somebody watches a missile through your phone. And you're, <laughs> Watch a missile through the phone. Well, like war games. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I, I think the era of that has passed. Um, there is this one famous uh, hacker named Kevin Mitnick who got sent to jail. He got caught um, through other like non necessarily phone related crimes, but he he was committing fraud. So he was in jail for a while, and they wouldn't. Uh, one of the stipulations was he cannot, he, he wasn't allowed to operate a telephone, like the prison payphones, because they were afraid that he would be able to whistle in the phone and start World War III. Yeah. Which, so, for the liability, <laughs> you can't do anything on this phone that you can't do for a quarter, you know, a quarter mile away, really. You can call 911, you know, but uh, I, 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 don't, I don't feel that I'm, Really providing people with, uh, I think I think any fraud that you commit on this phone is is, I don't think you can tie it to me really, because I don't because I don't um, encourage or enable, you know I don't I don't say you know. Like if you'd like to harass someone, you know I don't I don't like encourage people to do that, so. and that's you know that's important because people can use it for bad things, but the the whole point of it is that it's. You know, we want, it's a service, we want to confuse people. We, we're kind of cynical people, but we want, it's something that you can be nice with. You know, it's not something that you have to be a jerk when you use it. Yeah? Uh, you said that people were calling 911 here. Uh, can 911 find out where people are if they use that phone? Yeah, that costs us like a buck fifty a month. We've got to register that. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. What about like phone etiquette? Um, if you have more locations around the city, people start waiting in line, people start you know, beating each other up to use the phone, things like that. It's just kind of on them. Yeah, we don't have security or anything like that. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm psyched about trying to find locations, and my, my first thought, inspired by you, was how about my front yard? But then I remembered that my neighbor complains about any and all noise. I'm wondering if you've encountered. If, how would that work if there were people just making phone calls from their front yard? Is that my problem if they're making noise? Or do you know anything about that? Well, when I, before I did this, I thought, what the hell am I doing? Because um, I thought I was going to get tweakers yelling at their dealers in the middle of the night. And that is not, that is not been a problem. Um, this, luckily, this is a big enclosure and that like people talk in the enclosure. And, you know, I can sometimes hear people yelling, but I am... I am blessed by living in an industrial neighborhood next to a train crossing, so, <laughs> so people don't really mind it so much. But it's really, um, I, it's really, it hasn't been an issue really. Um, like, like, 
I, I, I can remember I can remember seeing you know obviously unbalanced people not in my phone you know, long ago like screaming into phones you know like I remember seeing this one woman uh, she was yelling at the phone and she would continue yelling as she walked away from the phone and then she would pick it up and you know and so but but you see that on the street you know you see that on the sidewalk anyway and I, I, I I'm surprised that it's been as nice as it has but in, in terms of setting up a phone in front of your house. That's something we're always interested in doing as long as it's publicly accessible. And this is a pretty heavy duty enclosure here, but um, I would like to set up something, just like get a bucket of concrete with a four by four in it and some kind of weather control, you know, weather like a box or something, and then a desk phone like nailed to that. <laughs> because that's, that's six bucks of goodwill. So when someone breaks it, you know, like, like it's gonna happen, what, once a year maybe? You know, that's, that's something that's within our budget, really. That, so that would be a low key thing. And then if it doesn't work out, you know, you, you can just saw the four by four off or something, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's just it's sort of like a little bucket of concrete or something. Yeah. What is one of these nice big boot jobs going to be? Uh, I think this one was 200 bucks for the enclosure. Phones, we like to get them for 100, but 150 is more realistic. That's, that's working with keys. Um, the, I, yeah, yeah this, this, this phone's kind of, I'm not gonna tell you that one. But um, the uh, the and the, uh, the 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 hardware itself is uh, ten bucks for the router and twenty five bucks for the SIP box. The SIP box, the VoIP box that the phone plugs into, is horrible because um, they would they uh, you would buy IP phone service. Um, you can still do that today, but they would sell you an internet phone. You plug it into your internet. You plug your phone into it. Um, but, and these, these boxes are just speaking VoIP, this protocol, which is an open protocol. But they're, a lot of times you get, they're, they're what's called carrier locked, where they, can, they will only communicate to this one server. And so now that server is now out of business. You know? And it's, sometimes it's hard to tell if this is a carrier locked one or not. So it's this wonderful little piece of technology. It took a lot of energy and uh, rare earths to make of these chips, and it's useless because you know, because they didn't want you to get free, because they want it's just evil, you know, so. You have a question? Um, I was wondering how much, it, how much payphone would be without the key? Oh, so you know, it all, you know, eBay and Craigslist, yeah. it's all negotiation, really. People, mm -hmm. you, you gotta talk people down sometimes. There's always people trying to, you can pay as much as you want for something, but you can sometimes get them for 75 bucks. It really depends. I mean, you have to, you have to be lucky, kind of camp out and wait for a deal to come by sometime. But that's, you know, I mean, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in this kind of thing, you have a, a future, long future in front of you of harvesting junk from eBay and Craigslist and other places like that. You just kind of have to be, have an eye for it and be patient. Okay. Yeah, one more? Or as many more as they let me? Yeah. Well, this, this one's on Lower Clinton Street. I'm not going to tell my exact address because this is probably going on the internet somewhere. But <laughs> Lower Clinton Street, yeah, near the new Mac stop, which is opening in September. And we, we we're always hoping to get more locations. We're working on. We're, I think I think I got someone who's um, softening them up. I think I think I got someone soon. I think it'll be future ones. Are you willing to share the second one? Huh? Are you willing to share the second one? Well, the second one's at Write Your Dream. Oh. Yeah. Which is not public. It's, it's available. It's kind of it's for their use right now. It's not not going to be available. I tried to get Sisters of the Road interested, and I don't think I convinced them that it would be free. I think they thought I was going to try and get something out of that. So, if anyone knows anyone there, it would be a good place. Yeah. When was when was Futel established? I don't know if you mentioned that, and I just wasn't didn't hear you. But like, has this been going on for a couple years? Is this something that you started like? Not very long ago. Not that that really matters, but like with data, you know, getting 200 minutes a month or a week, everything has that been like you know, the past six weeks? Is that like the first, you know, beginning of it? Oh, that yeah, that's a recent number because at first, um, I just put the phone booth up there, and I, there was no way to tell that it was free or anything like that. In fact, they didn't it didn't even say free on top; it just said phone, and. Uh, I didn't tell anyone. Um, I kind of let people discover it, and I wanted to see like how the usage would grow. And I would see people um, like 
ride, I, like my street gets a lot of what we call Clinton Street Cadillacs going down it, which is you know, bikes pulling shopping carts. And I would see people say like, hey, that's, that, that phone's free if you want to use it or something like that. But so that phone went up in November, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, we were, we, we would have, I mean, we were working on learning how to do this for a long time before that because it, it was a kind of a, a, a a learning curve to learn it, but we would put up temporary phones sometimes to, before that. Yeah? Uh, is this something you'd like to expand on, or would you want to see this grow a little bit, or is this something you want to keep kind of small and personal and, and meaningful and in kind of the upper line? Oh, uh, well, we'd like to expand it. I mean, um, our costs, I mean, we kind of have the the basic cost and then the usage cost is, like right now our basic cost, the, the usage cost is not as much as just our monthly fees that we pay for it. So yeah, we're, we're interested in that definitely. And we're all, I mean, at some point, well, some point being now really, but we're gonna have to get more funding, figure out like grants and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess all the questions you were asking about um, recommendations for location, is that something that you're, are you always on the lookout for locations when you're watching them? Oh yeah. You know, yeah, always on the lookout. Um, if anyone knows of anything, yeah, please. But yeah, um, uh, and you know what I, what I really want to do, I'm, I'm going to do this someday. You see a lot of phone uh, kiosks without a phone in them anymore. Yeah. So I, I, I need to find one with electricity <coughs> and some hackable Wi-Fi nearby. I just want to install a phone there and you know, it would get, it'll get taken away eventually, but you know, uh, I really want to do that, yeah. Yeah? Um, you use the phrase urban kiosk as kind of an umbrella term of which these phones are a part of. Do you have any ideas of other types of urban kiosks that you want to implement? That's a good question. We had um, an unrelated group. We had a, um, uh, in a gallery in Old Town, the Diode Gallery, we had a Robotron game that you could play by touching the window and it would detect where your fingers were. Like anything that lets you interact with uh, interact with something, something interactive, that would be nice. Like the, uh, if if any of you remember the Church of Elvis, yeah, that was, um, yeah, yeah. She um, she ran that off of Commodore sixty fours, yeah. So that was you know I, I like how that I mean she had a and she also had this little she had a little barrier to entry. You had to put a quarter in to use her little devices, which is kind of cool too. You know because like. You know, it's not like she was making big bucks off those quarters, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The phone system uh, is being sort of uh, studied by the companies that own it, and who is the to figure out how to do other things too. <coughs> and then uh, you have this system, and sort of what's your, your balance of interest in studying how it's used? Well, a little of both. I mean, we have a, we have a, we have a, we have a philosophy. We have what we want to encourage, you know, which is like whether, I mean, in terms of philanthropy, we could probably do some other useful things if we did, if we weren't tied to our, what we want to encourage really, you know, maybe. But I like seeing how it's used within that, like w within that uh, within that framework, like I never thought that a guy would be calling, using it for over an hour in the middle of the night, you know, to call to call someone. Um, and that, I mean, that's interesting to me because that guy's motivated. Like it right now, it hangs up on you every half an hour just because we don't want someone just like leaving it off the hook and paying for that. So it hangs up on you and you have to call again, you know. But and he does that, you know. So whatever people are motivated to do, um, I like to do. And I think the answer to that will be more, um, allowing more input from people, really. Letting people, letting people like talk without calling an operator, you know. Letting people talk on a more low-key way on, on saying what they like or what they want. Yeah? So with this name, like the obvious yeah. <laughs> Um. 
I think it was the first and last choice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Um, if anyone wants a sticker, uh, uh, please grab one. All right, uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, we return uh, April 21st with designer and typographer Gus Nicholas with his talk, Words Can't Be Trusted an eclectic presentation of typography and visual language, masks, and patterns. Typography is a big idea to tackle. The word can mean different things depending on who speaks it and in what context. Typography is both technical and aesthetic. Designing a font is part craft, part engineering, and uses both sides of the brain. I plan to draw a circle around fundamental and abstract general and granular aspects of typography and visual language. Far from linear and comprehensive, I will narrate a miscellaneum of form, discovery, ideas, and moments threaded together over images. Sounds pretty good, right? And let's have another uh, round of applause for this talk.